Up to 6 million Jews, around 5.7 million Soviet civilians, around 1.8 million non-Jewish Polish, 312,000 Serb civilians, up to 250,000 disabled people, around 208,000 gypsies, around 1,900 Jehovah's Witnesses, hundreds to thousands of homosexuals. Total, approximately 14,272,400 human beings. This is the number of deaths the Holocaust has caused according to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website. The Holocaust was a concept originating from a single individual, but it took the support of an entire nation and its own paramilitary organization to pull off. Monsters, inhumane, sadistic, heartless, sociopathic. The Nazis of Nazi Germany have many adjectives attributed to them, and seldom are any of them good. They brutally murdered millions, and a lot of them, including Schutzstaffel Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann, use the same defense. Befehl ist Befehl, or in English, an order is an order, saying that they are not responsible for the orders they are given, and those that are truly to blame are the higher-ups. At the beginning of the Holocaust, and on the other side of the world, a Jewish boy was born in the Bronx of New York City. His name was Stanley Milgram, and his family was affected by the Holocaust, with multiple members having survived the Nazi concentration camps and bearing the concentration camp tattoos. This led Milgram to having a sort of fascination with the struggle of the Jewish people during the Holocaust, having written a letter to his childhood friend John Schaefer saying, I should have been born in the German-speaking Jewish community of Prague in 1922 and then died in a gas chamber some 20 years later. How I came to be born in the Bronx Hospital, I'll never quite understand. Milgram later received a PhD in social psychology from Harvard and became an assistant professor at Yale in the fall of 1960. He bore witness to the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann and he heard the Befehl ist Befehl defense. Seeing Eichmann claim his superiors held the true responsibility of the Holocaust coupled with his fascination of the Holocaust inspired Milgram in creating the concept for what was later called the Milgram Experiment on Obedience to Authority Figures. The experiment's aim was to answer one question. Could it be that Eichmann and his million accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders? Could we call them all accomplices? How did he determine the answer to this burning question? Well, let's look at the methodology. There were three individuals involved in each instance of the experiment. The experimenter himself, the teacher, and the learner. The process would go as follows. The learner was strapped to a shock generator and was asked questions by the teacher. If the learner gave the correct answer, the teacher would simply move to the next question. However, if the answer was incorrect, the teacher would tell them that they are incorrect and would give them a shock after telling them the intensity of said shock. The shock generator had a minimum of 15 volts, listed as slight shock, and would go up to 375 volts, listed as danger, severe shock, and even up to 450 volts, listed as triple X, in 15 volt increments. Although the teacher and learner were informed that this experiment was to test learning's correlation with positive punishment, a la B.F. Skinner's theory of operant conditioning, this was not the case. The true purpose of the experiment was to see how far the teacher would go in physically punishing the learner as long as he was ordered to by the experimenter. The learner was an accomplice to the experiment and so he was never physically hurt, but the teacher believed he was causing the man pain regardless. The learner would react to the shocks with cries and even screams. However, what the teacher heard was not the learner himself, but a pre-recording of the learner responding to the quote-unquote shocks. The pre-recorded audio went as follows. Starting at 75 volts, the learner begins expressing loud painful cries. Starting at 150 volts, the learner would begin complaining about heart pains and demanding to be let out. This gets continuously louder until 300 volts. Starting at 300 volts, the learner refuses to continue answering. This is considered giving an incorrect answer, and so they are punished. He continues to get louder until 345 volts. Starting at 345 volts, the learner is silent, giving the teacher the impression that he has died. He is silent for the rest of the experiment. Many teachers refused to punish at one point or another, but Milgram knew this would happen. In preparation, the experimenter had four pre-planned orders to give the teacher. If they refused one, they would read out the following order, each time becoming more and more assertive. The orders were, Please continue. The experiment requires you to continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice but to continue. Also, another point to make, Whenever the subject would ask who would take full responsibility if anything extreme should happen to the learner, the experimenter would assure them that he would take full responsibility. Before the experiment began, experts believed only 1-3% to of the subjects would reach 450 volts. 
They thought you'd have to be pathological or a psychopath to be able to consciously dish out so much pain to another human being. However, the results of the experiment revealed otherwise. Now, there were 40 subjects. 5 stopped at 300 volts. 10 stopped between 375 and 420 volts. 25 did not stop altogether and went as far as giving 450 volt shocks not once, not twice, but thrice. 3 had what was described as, quote unquote, full-blown uncontrollable seizures. Every subject were more willing to continue after learning the experimenter will take full responsibility should anything happen to the learner. As you can see, the results are rather telling of our hidden human nature. A lot more subjects went farther than previously assumed. Why was this? One explanation deals with the theory of cognitive dissonance. Now, what is cognitive dissonance? Well, to explain this theory, let's look at a few years before the events of the Milgram experiment to 1959. One Leon Festinger and Merrill Carlsmith conducted an experiment using human subjects. The subjects were told to finish very long and very boring tasks, like turning pegs in a pegboard for an hour. Afterwards, the subjects were paid $1 or $20 to tell a waiting subject, who was an accomplice in the experiment, that the tasks they were given were very interesting and very fun. Now, what was interesting about the results was that the $1 group tried significantly harder than the $20 group did at arguing that the tasks were fun and interesting. You'd think that those who were paid more would try harder because they were given more money to do so, but no 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 no. It was the other way around. Now, what could explain this? Cognitive dissonance can. Cognitive dissonance theory puts forward the idea that every person has an inner drive to keep all of our thoughts and actions in harmony to avoid disharmony or dissonance. We'll use an example to better illustrate this. Imagine you smoke cigarettes. You know smoking is bad because research shows that smoking can cause lung cancer. This causes cognitive dissonance. The cognitive dissonance claims that we humans do everything we can to get rid of this dissonance. Using the same example, you could use new information like Research has not definitely proven that smoking causes lung cancer to help reduce the dissonance. In Festinger's experiment, those that were only paid $1 didn't feel like the single dollar was enough of a justification for lying to others. So they tried even harder to lie about the experiment so that they could hope to convince themselves that it was fun and therefore lower the dissonance in their psyche. We see the same thing happening in Milgram's experiment. A lot of us humans believe it's morally wrong to hurt one another, and the subjects of Milgram's experiment were no different. They were given the task to do just that, and instead of going with their morality and refusing to inflict such pain onto another, they did as they were ordered. This certainly caused some cognitive dissonance in their psyche, and the question becomes, how did they handle dealing with such a large amount of cognitive dissonance? The answer is simple, really. They use the experimenter as a catalyst for their dissonance, a sort of lightning rod, if you will. In their minds, they may have been the one to directly inflict shocks to the learner, but they weren't responsible for the shocks. That was all on the experimenter. Remember, the experimenter even told them that he would take full responsibility should anything happen to the learner. This acted as the ideal safety net for the subjects, and instead of feeling guilt over their actions, they moved that guilt over to their superior, the experimenter sitting behind them overlooking the experiment. There were variations in the Milgram experiment where Milgram changed the methodology to see how the results were affected, and so before we end this episode, let's look at them real quick. The first alteration he tried was to have the experimenter not wear a lab coat and instead wear casual clothes. This caused the obedience level to drop to 20%, likely due to the lowering in authority via the loss of the lab coat. The second alteration was a change of location. The original experiment took place in the impressive Yale University, but the alterated variation moved it to a set of run-down offices. This lowered the obedience level to 47.5%, likely due to the lowering in the apparent legitimacy of the experiment. In the third alteration, the subject was given an assistant they could instruct to inflict the shocks to the learner. This raised the amount of subjects that went to the maximum 450 volts to 92.5%, likely due to the large lowering in personal guilt felt by the infliction of shocks. In the fourth alteration, the subject had to force the learner's hand down onto a shock plate when they refused to participate after 150 volts. This lowered the obedience level to 30%, likely due to the fact that they are not only forced to bear witness to the pain the learner is suffering, but be the one to physically cause it. In the fifth alteration, there were two other teachers who were accomplices that refused to obey the experimenter. Accomplice 1 stopped at 150 volts and Accomplice 2 stopped at 210 volts. 
This lowered the obedience level to 10%, likely due to seeing that disobeying authority and going with morality is a feasible option. In the sixth and final alteration, the experimenter was not in the room and instructed the subject by telephone. This lowered the obedience level to 20.5%. Many participants cheated and gave less voltage than ordered by the experimenter. There were several that even outright skipped giving out shocks altogether. This clearly indicates the presence of the authority figure affects obedience. Well, that about does it for this episode of Ceres Reality. I hope you liked it, and if you did, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, as well as clicking the notification bell to be notified about new episodes when they arrive. Feel free to follow me on Twitter and Google+, as well as support me on Patreon for my work here. That can all be found in the description below. This part of the voiceover may sound different from the previous sections, but that's because in the middle of the video's production, I hit a milestone. Great thanks to A-Man for being my very first patron. Not just that, but he was generous enough to pledge $5 a month. For that, A-Man, you have my eternal gratitude. I'm Seraph, and I'll see you lovely people next time.